Hello, everybody. We're going to get started in uh, just a moment. My name is Mike Morneau. I'm with Learning Times. I'll be your technical producer today. And uh, before we get the session underway, I just want to remind participants uh, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see two, uh, two chat areas, or one of them is a chat where you can feel free to put in any comments. Uh, tell us where you're coming from today. Um, what have you. But um, you can communicate with me via the chat if you need assistance. And the Q&A is available also for accessible from the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions for our presenter today, feel free to use the Q&A and uh, it will make it a little bit easier to uh, facilitate the questions for him. So without uh, further delay, I'll pass things off to Robin Bauer Kilgo. Go ahead, Robin. Thanks, Mike. Hi, everyone. I want to welcome everyone to this next C2C Care webinar, Long-Term Storage for Large Functional Objects Vehicles. Um, before I start, I would like to acknowledge this webinar is being moderated on the traditional lands of the Miccosukee and Seminole people and their ancestors, and I pay my respect to elders both past and present. So I'm just going to run through a couple of quick opening slides about some programming and some other items, and then we're going to go ahead and jump into today's program, which we're pretty excited about just because I love learning about these objects. I think that it's surprising to see how many of us have these types of objects in our collection, so it should be a pretty good time today just finding out how to store them and handle them. So again, my name is Robin Bauer Kilgo. I am the C2C Care Coordinator, and you just saw Mike Morno. He's our senior producer over at Learning Times. If you have any questions about programming or anything else, feel free to say hello in the chat. This is our home on the web, connectingtocollections.org. On that website, you will find all sorts of information, including an archive of past uh, webinars, archive of past courses all sorts of fun stuff. We also have links to our discussion board, which is C2C Care, and um, a curated resources list. So I encourage you to go to the website if you've been there. You can also sign up for upcoming webinars on that website. We have two new upcoming webinars coming up in the next few months. Um, our last one for 2021 is called New Tools of the Trade. It's actually going to be talking about some online assessment tools that are accessible to everyone to use within your small institution. So I encourage you to go sign up for that webinar that's scheduled for December 14th. And then our first webinar of 2022 is Introduction to Digital Collections Management. So uh, we're excited about that one because we're partnering with uh, some of our friends over at CCAHA to actually bring that one on. So again, those are free. So I encourage you to go to our website, connectingtocollections.org, and you can sign up for those webinars. We also have two homes on social media. That is our Facebook page and our Twitter account. There we tend to post pretty regularly on upcoming programming and some other items happening within the community. So I encourage you to go check out those if you're on either one of those social media venues. As Mike said, within Zoom webinar, you have two outlets to communicate with us as the presenter, myself or Paul, our presenter today. Um, one is the chat box. You guys are rocking the chat box right now, so I don't think I'm going to explain how to use that, but um, it's there for you to say hello or if you're having technical issues. The Q&A box is there for questions, so if you have a question for our presenter at any point during the webinar, please use that Q&A box. It just helps us kind of track where we are within the, the questions during the webinar, and you can put a question at any point, so if it pops into your head, go ahead and put it in that Q&A box. Uh, one item that I wanted to let you guys know about that's kind of connected to our topic today. Um, recently, we were informed about an IMLS grant that the next deadline is December 14th, 2021 at Save America's Treasures. Um, they've actually recently funded within the last granting cycle some projects dealing with large vehicles. One was for a passenger train car, and then recently they've done four ships, including two battleships. So if you are dealing with an object like this within your collection and you're interested in getting some funding for it, I encourage you to go to the website listed down below. Um, hopefully most people know about imls.gov here in the States, but I would encourage you to go there, go to grants and go to Save America's Treasure Grants and you might be able to find some funding for some objects. So I encourage you to go there. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker today, uh, Paul Storch. He has been in the museum collections and conservation field since 1978 and has worked in natural history and history museums in various parts of the U.S. He is currently a freelancer who runs his own consultancy firm called Museum Science Consultants out of St. Paul, Minnesota. So Paul, take it away and we'll see you at the end of the webinar for the Q&A. Okay, <clears throat> well thank you for the introduction and uh, thanks to everybody that's joining. Uh, 
get going here. Okay, so uh, we're gonna basically focus on long-term uh, storage for uh, large functional vehicles. I've uh, really expanded the scope a little bit when I was um, approached to uh, with this webinar topic. Um, <clears throat> it was about um, the inquiry was about uh, internal combustion, you know, self-propelled uh, vehicles. But given my experience and and what I know, uh, particularly small to medium-sized his, uh, history museums, what they have in their collections, it's a, it's a little bit more than just uh, early 20th century you know, cars and and trucks. It, it really includes wagons and. Uh, my experience with the Minnesota Historical Society uh, starting in 1990, uh, they have a fair amount of fire equipment uh, on wheels as well as farm equipment and wheeled uh, steam, steam powered uh, objects. And so what I'm including in this is both self-propelled and uh, horse-drawn with or without engines or um, motors. So that kind of defines the scope. And then some other uh, definitions I wanted to go over would be uh, working condition. And if the object has a uh, engine or propulsion system, then that would be in, in full working order. Um, generally those were acquired uh, in excellent condition and having usually having been fully restored uh, in most cases by some sort of out, outside organization and then it gets acquired or don donated to the uh, museum. Uh, <clears throat> keeping it in working condition and we'll discuss this uh, throughout the webinar, but uh, requires resources being available for regular maintenance and semi-annual uh, running, uh, even if it's not actually on the road, uh, if it's in, in storage and you want to keep it in working condition, it, it has to be uh, run. And there also needs to be uh, written procedures and uh, that somebody is responsible for carrying out. Then uh, non-working retired from use, which is generally the more common situation. Uh, the decision for that would be resources are not available uh, for regular maintenance. Uh, it's on either in long-term storage or on display, which could also be considered long-term storage in, in, a, in a sense. Um, and also this decision would come into play if it's a unique object. Uh, one of a kind early automobile, uh, a unique uh, carriage with, with uh, very specific historic provenance, um, that, that kind of issue. Uh, or again, if it's used for exhibits, because exhibits of long, uh, large functional objects, um, to have them run brings in all kinds of issues and, and problems and requirements. So, uh, and requires, again, a lot of resources. So generally the best decision is not to have them <clears throat> have them running when on, on display to use alternative means of showing the, the function. Uh, so the discussion here is gonna be really based on uh, non-working with the possibility of at some point in the future, possibly bringing it back to working. So that's the idea of uh, the long-term storage and the preparation is to keep it in uh, a sta very stable uh, condition. So at some point it, it could go back to working without any further deterioration. So long-term storage, what do we mean by that? <clears throat> Again, as I just said, uh, ensure long-term preservation uh, with preparation being the most involved stage. 
but after that, it's really becomes a sustainable, uh, a sustainable condition where what you're doing is uh, with minimal intervention, minimal energy, uh, you're maintaining the storage environment in, in a holistic uh, manner, which includes um, inspections, pest control, uh, as much as possible maintenance of, of um, temperature and humidity conditions in a sustainable manner. And that's, that's a whole other webinar in itself. And there are other, uh, other information available on how to do that. Uh, and light, light control as well. So with proper long-term storage, uh, also called uh, mothballing, and that's a term you'll find with uh, also long-term storage for architectural uh, objects, uh, historic sites that are no longer open for interpretation for various reasons. Uh, the National U.S. National Park Service uses that uh, term in one of their technical bulletins on how to how to do that. It's it's a fairly the principles are, are similar to whether it's a building or a large functional object. So what you want to prevent are uh, seized moving parts um, that would occur from uh, moisture getting in, uh, changes, oxidation and fuels and lubricants. <clears throat> Once it is no longer uh, functioning, uh, leakage of fluids, if those are still in, uh, included, uh, you don't want that happening in, uh, either in storage or if the, the objects on display uh, because of the, the, you know, the effect on the floors and a possible toxicity. Then you're removing hazardous materials, um, which again could uh, include fuels, fluids. Uh, I don't want to go too far into it, but also lead, lead paint and asbestos might be in some of the older uh, older items. Uh, as we move further into the 21st century, um, electric vehicles and, and the batteries, and I'm sure <clears throat> many of you have heard of some of the issues with those, with the lithium batteries. So at some point, museums are gonna to have to deal with those. And, uh, hopefully they'll be they'll be improved and the, the hazards will be less than those, but that's that's something to uh, consider and, and start to plan for as well. Um, proper storage preparation prevents uh, the oxidation corrosion of uh, the in interior surfaces of both the, the engines and, and inside the vehicle. Uh, and then organic material deterioration too could be, well, ideally prevented, but at least slow down some of these materials like uh, rubber, uh, even the older plastics like uh, cellulose, nitrate, uh, some of the, the early synthetic fabrics, um, faux, faux leather that you'll find as canopies and seat covers in early automobiles. Um, a lot of them have what's called inherent vice where the material itself, no matter what you do will deteriorate. So there's um, in the uh, resource section, uh, the CCI has excellent um, conservation notes that go into detail on how to what to look for and, and identify those materials and how to how to care for them so i'm going to keep keep this at the preser preservation more basic level and not get too much into into talking about treat particular treatments or uh deterioration processes but i just wanted to mention that as something to to consider uh, and then it also eliminates regular fluid changes and running or exercising the engines. Um, and then as far as required actions, um, you know, what, it, what is the preparation for 
mothballing. Well, basic principles, uh, the materials and methods method should be reversible uh, or retreatable to the fullest extent possible. And that, that's always a, a goal of conservation, pres preservation uh, actions. Uh, each case really needs to be looked at individually because sometimes there may be a material or a component where you have to go in and be a little more interventive. Uh, also, the case could be made that cleaning, removing dirt from, uh, from a surface is not reversible. Of course, logically it's, it's not, but uh, any kind of, uh, more in, in, intense cleaning. You want to make sure the uh, products used won't do any any harm. Uh, and anything you put on uh, coating, say wax or something like that, could be fairly easily removed. So that, that's what we're I'm talking about with that. And then procedures and processes should meet the American Institute for Conservation Code of Ethics guidelines. Uh, for practice, at least in, in the U.S. Um, <clears throat> if you're another country, then whatever the um, standards there, uh, institution that you're part of or follow uh, or policies and, and uh, wherever you are would incorporate those. Uh, and they, they are fairly well accepted, the AIC. So that helps in um, in writing contracts, as I'll get to in a second. So for the actual uh, mechanical preparation, uh, unless you have um, somebody in house or uh, say a local um, car club or um, so, you know, uh, some other type of volunteer or skilled volunteers uh, uh, that are working with you. Uh, one way to go is to contact a <clears throat> qualified mechanic who has experience on um, historic or antique vehicles or somebody in the region or possibly a conservation firm that, that specializes in that. Uh, <clears throat> and. Um, then to prepare a contract with with specifications again using the, the code of ethics and guidelines for practice um, that would um, scope out the methods and materials um, that they would propose to use uh, and then something that's important um, if you're going to have the the engines um, or motors uh, mothballed would be to require photographic and written documentation of all steps and, and stages of the work. And a lot of times if it's uh, um, mechanical or um, you know, en <clears throat> engine vendor that restores antique cars, they may not, well, at least about 20 years ago, um, it took a bit to work with them to really get them up to the requirements that MHS wanted at the time. Nowadays, uh, with digital photography and, and smartphones having videos, it, it's much easier. And I think people are much more uh, familiar with documenting just about everything. So. It's the written documentation that you have to be uh, pretty specific about of the quality and, and what needs to be included and and follow up through the project on that to make sure that that's up to what you what you need. Uh, but but that's very important for before, during, and after <clears throat> any stages of the work, all stages of the work, and then to, to specify and spec out the re. Uh, of course, the cost and the uh, requirements for transport, safe transport and, and delivery uh, back to your institution. 
So getting more into preservation measures, uh, talking about a, a base, base level cleaning that should be done on large functional objects uh, as they come in uh, upon acquisition. Uh, this is just standard procedures. Um, and there's um, one that I wrote that's in the, the resources. So there's a link to that. So you can you can check out that later, uh, but the the basic components of that would be to do a con a condition report before you do anything. Note the problem problem materials. Um, remove and then once that's done with with um, at least basic level photo documentation uh, to remove. Uh, the dust and, and debris, and with particularly farm, this is important with uh, farm equipment on wheels would be, oftentimes it could have uh, plant materials, uh, old mouse and other, other animal nests, uh, feathers, you, you name it, as well, you know, as well as um, bird droppings, bad droppings. Uh, so during that part of the process, you want to be, uh, you know, you use treat it as ha possible hazardous material and uh, be prepared with uh, personal protective equipment at, at minimum uh, N95 masks, which everybody should have now. Uh, Possibly Tyvek suits, uh, which you can get from different suppliers, uh, and and gloves, and then <clears throat> bag and dispose of the, the material properly. Uh, remove uh, remove fluids and and disconnect the battery. Um, that would just be the basic level. Deeper removal would come with the actual mechanical mothballing procedure, uh, check for pests, which in this case would be for any kind of active infestation. So again, with any vehicles or uh, objects with wo wooden components in particular, especially farm, farm equipment like large threshers uh, could possibly have uh, wood boring Beetles, you know, powder posts, depending species, depending where you are, even dry wood termites sometimes. Uh, vehicles with um, horsehair stuffing for the upholstery or wool uh, fabric may have domestic beetles and possibly even moths. So you want to look look at that, and then. Um, best approach would be to con uh, contact a conservator or a regional conservation center for uh, further advice and, and help on, on dealing with that and, and mitigating the pest issues. Um, secure any loose components. Uh, I'll show some examples of that later on. Uh, and then put on uh, supports so the wheels or <clears throat> tires are off, off the ground and both for uh, to minimize distortion but also contact with uh, concrete floors and to well facilitate cleaning underneath the vehicles but also to uh, lower the risk of water damage if there are uh, leaks. And then finally, uh, dust covers are important to, well, minimize intervention later on. Um, and, and dust is also, um, you know, something that could affect paint layers, uh, tracks pest, uh, tracks moisture. So uh, you're eliminating uh, fair fair amount of risk just with uh, simple dust cover. And there's, again, in the resources, there's suggestions for that, what to use, different 
different types of tarps uh, and <clears throat> plastic basic polyethylene sheeting works uh, well as, as well. Um, so in terms of uh, support, um, standard uh, floor axle jacks, which are wild, widely available. Um, and those, those could be uh, modified and padded as needed. And, you know, to select the main thing is to select ones with um, the proper weight capacity for the vehicle. Uh, then there's something called GoJax, which is a brand name, and I'll, I'll show that in a couple of minutes. Uh, those are less of a um, static support, but they're they're good for um, moving objects around, not necessarily leaving on them on for a while, but uh, it's very convenient, especially if you have a tight space or you have to uh, maneuver a vehicle. Uh, into another space for, for work. Uh, those come in very handy and they're good to have a set around. And then uh, four wheelers, again, could be used for moving, uh, but as well for storage. Um, and what I'm talking about are the, um, the movers uh, equipment. They're um, four pieces of wood with, cat, uh, with casters a caster in each corner, and usually they have carpet on the top. Uh, but those can be used for lighter lighter vehicles. Um, they're very convenient. And then finally, uh, custom made angle iron frames with uh, wheels or ca uh, casters. Um, and I'll, I'm going to show some examples of that. Um, it takes a little bit more in terms of design and finding a vendor to make that and. Uh, of course, the, the cost is more than, um, than the other options. So here are some examples of that. Um, this is in the uh, large object and exhibit uh, storage warehouse here in St. Paul, um, run by the Minnesota Historical Society. And here, on the left are examples of, uh, of the frame. You can see it's uh, the gray painted powder coated angle iron with uh, solid metal uh, wheels at each corner. And then the axle bearing here, it's a little hard to see the, the hub uh, hides it, but there's a U-shape support right in there that's been, been padded uh, with a polyethylene foam uh, to avoid scratching, give it a little shock absorbance. Uh, but these are um, relatively light carriages. And so when they're on the frame, uh, there's about three, four inches clearance here under the wheels. Um, these could easily be moved by two people. Uh, so it, it's uh, very convenient. And here you can see the dust dust covers. Um, and here's a, a wide angle shot. It's a little bit pixelated, but it, it gives you the, the variety of the vehicles and a storage confirmation uh, for long term storage and you know le leaving aisles to be able to move things around. Um, let's see. To show some of the other ones on supports, several different kinds of supports. Uh, also, what could be used for smaller functional objects are flat, flat carts or modified pallets, um, either on wheels or just to use a, a pallet jack to move them around if, if needed. But they're they're off the floor. Um, and they're in a way where you don't have to actually uh, use the actual wheels of the vehicle to move it, uh, and it could be shifted when it, whenever needed. Um, just briefly, because it's relevant to some of the case studies, uh, if you can make out, this is a very large 1930s um, knife, uh, it was a mobile knife sharpening shop. 
a very heavy truck and a angle iron uh, frame was built for it, but when it was being moved, uh, it was just too heavy even for that. So it was taken off that and, <clears throat> and put on uh, uh, high capacity jacks. So this one doesn't move <laughs> very often. Uh, that just didn't, there's a point where it'll just have to stay in place if it's so large and so heavy. So now getting into the, uh, the kind of classic mothballing procedure, good example is uh, Charles A. Lindbergh's 1959 uh, Beetle, uh, which he purchased new um, and drove it well really all around the world but it wound up in Little Falls Minnesota and uh, in the late 70s it was acquired after he passed away it was acquired by the the whole site was acquired by the historical society and it's uh, it's been on display hey, and here you can see it's up on on uh, axle jacks while on display. It's currently back at the site. This one's at the History Center, but before uh, it was displayed in the early 2000s, uh, the decision was made to do a full uh, mothballing long-term storage preparation uh, at the mechanical level. So a vendor uh, with experience with Volkswagens and other German cars uh, got the contract, which was overseen by the exhibits department at the time um, I was involved uh, with working up the specs, but uh, later on with stabilizing the body. So the the mechanical stable, full mechanical stabilization was done by an outside vendor, mechanical vendor. So here it is in the shop with the body off. And then some during, uh, during treatments of the before and then uh, well, here's before, and this is during uh, the disassemb full disassembly cleaning uh, with uh, solvents uh, of all the uh, fuel residues and, uh, and lubricants and oil being removed. And then uh, reassembly uh, back into the uh, car, and here's being prepared to go back go to the history center. And then this is a shot of uh, what I was talking about with the GoJack uh, devices. <clears throat> These are uh, rubber padded rollers and it fits in perpendicular uh, to the tire. And then there's a foot pedal and you squeeze in these, these rollers so it lifts the, the tire up. Uh, you put them on all four. <clears throat> and then there's um, four casters on the GoJack. So it, it moves any direction you want. You can see going around fairly tight corners, getting it into the uh, objects lab. And um, it, just briefly in, in terms of the uh, treatment, this was a dent that was put in by Lindbergh's daughter the first time she drove it. Um, getting it out of the garage at Little Falls. It's a 90 degree turn and uh, he never got it fixed. So it's very much part of the history and the story of this vehicle. So the decision was made while stabilizing other uh, corrosion areas um, and, and problems with, with the, um, the body and in the interior, this was, the rust was, um, stabilized, but the dent was left in, in place and the scratches, all that is part of the history. So that's something to consider as well. And just some shots of uh, other issues that were uh, conserved and stabilized in the lab and a, a shot of it in, inside. <clears throat> uh, moving on to some of the other types uh, of vehicles, including in, in the scope would be uh, a steam traction engine. So this is self-propelled steam tractor. And um, just showing some of the, the before treatment. Uh, again, this was 
a little bit more of a um, conservation level, but uh, what I want to show here is some of the uh, shots of, of the basic level using compressed air uh, to get the dirt off. Uh, the original condition of this um, was it was used on a farm uh, and then abandoned, rescued by uh, steam traction uh, aficionados and restorers in the 1950s and they restored it. So what you're seeing with the, the paint scheme and, and the detailing here was not fully original to the piece. So that's something to consider in doing base level cleaning and then any further conservation would be uh, whether you take it back to full original condition or preserve what you, um, the, the restoration of which is what was done here. But I uh, just want to show it was kept in a barn until acquired <clears throat> by the historical society for permanent display, static display at the Mill City Museum in Minneapolis. So it's pretty typical water damage, uh, most likely from the last use. It was retired in the 1980s uh, after a state boiler inspector failed it and the decision was made not to keep it running. So it had been restored and then, and then running uh, for about 30 years and then stored in a collector's barn. So uh, that's fairly typical, what you're gonna find for the base level is still dirt, uh, corrosion, bird droppings, that type of thing. And then here it is in, in conserved condition with, again, it was re retouched paint. There was a component that was restored, but uh, just the base level cleaning got the rust off, stabilized that. Um, and then since it's on display, it can't be a dust cover. So it, it needs to be inspected and, and cleaned by the exhibits tech regularly. Uh, then an example of a horse drawn, but kerosene powered um, fire uh, pumper. This is a 1909 model. Uh, made by the Waterers Company in St. Paul is still in business. They make uh, pumps and fire hydrants and other firefighting equipment. But uh, the society has a, a number of, uh, of pieces of wheel, wheeled equipment by them, including a steam, uh, 1890 steam pumper, and this is the next generation. So uh, this is an example of rubber, uh, rubberized fabric. Uh, water hose and some of the issues that could be with that you can have with that mainly uh, supporting again this is the before but <clears throat> better support for this to minimize any further deterioration of the rubber hosing um, so that's something to consider and then uh, the level of long-term storage prep for this was not complete mechanical disassembly, but as, as much as accessible. And then cleaning off the, the residues, kerosene in particular can uh, harden up the, the heavier component, petroleum components form uh, kind of what's called varnish. Uh, so using solvents to get that off. Uh, the, the brass was um, stabilized, cleaned, and then uh, as much as possible, the, the hoses were, <clears throat> were cleaned and supported and, and both internally and externally. Uh, and that this was done for a, for a loan and it was on loan for a while now at a fire, local firefighting museum and it's back on in storage. Uh, this was a, a more basic level. Uh, there was some stabilization of components, but uh, Mainly, it's uh, it's being just base level cleaned. Um, this was a prototype um, in silage harvester. Uh, part of it was a, run by a tractor, so it would be used to harvest corn and then 
hook up to a silo and load it into a silo to, to save a lot of time and, and labor. So basically this was support cleaned, uh, checked for pests and then put on the proper support. This, this is a first level just to get it off the ground and to move it, but later for display and now for storage, it has a um, uh, one of those angle iron supports so that the front could be off the ground and <clears throat> as well as the back and it doesn't doesn't need to turn on these to be moved now getting into uh some of the the case studies and thank all of you who, who sent those in some very interesting objects uh i have a few uh, from the uh, Smithsonian uh, National uh, Post Post Office or Postal Museum. So this is a uh, large, heavy mid mid century bus that was used as mobile post office. Uh, so the issue with, with this for long term storage, uh, <laughs> at fir first glance, when I went over, I thought, well possibly use uh, some sort of support, but looking more into the description of it, uh, that would not be practical. Um, it takes uh, two tow trucks to move it, <laughs> move it anywhere, one, at, one on each end, one to push, one to pull. So uh, that's a lot of resources. If at all possible, uh, move maybe annually, uh, back and forth just to reduce the pressure on, on the uh, on the tires. Uh, the storage environment apparently has been improved recently uh, for better temperature and humidity control. Um, again, make sure all the fluids are and battery is out. Um, and then at some point, uh, <clears throat> it would be best to pack the engine uh, with, with Cosmoline or equivalent. Um, I believe I neglected to mention that with the uh, Volkswagen, but that, that was the main uh, uh, action that was taken with once they uh, cleaned all the components and had, had them uh, disassembled before reassembled, uh, Cosmoline was put in there. And that's a uh, heavy viscosity petroleum based uh, moisture exclusion uh, compound. There's uh, a link in the resources. You can look at that. It's still available. And it's kind of legendary with uh, developed with the military. And there were stories floating around that uh, in the 70s, 80s, you could buy a complete World War II Jeep packed in Cosmo in barrels. And, and packed in Cosmoline and put it together and have a usable Jeep. And I'm not sure if that's ever true or not, but uh, <clears throat> that's what it was used for and it is quite effective. Um, then again, use do an annual inspection, uh, particularly of the, uh, the interior components. Uh, for pest, pest exclusion, use i would suggest using live live traps inside if that's an issue uh you most likely never going to exclude them from something like that so the best way is to monitor and, and trap no no baits of course um no toxic baits but uh live trapping which would require uh, regular inspections A uh, slightly smaller, uh, lighter vehicle, um, and <clears throat> so it's a wooden uh, wagon on wooden wheels. Uh, again, for long-term storage, overall cleaning, and this is one that could either be put on jacks, a mobile frame, or the lowest cost, easiest would be padded four-wheelers. Then there were uh, there was a postal wagon very uh, very similar to this in the NHS collection and that panoramic view uh, 
over on the right, lower right hand side, uh, side and that was put on uh, <clears throat> the four wheelers. Uh, it's, these things are light enough where one or even one or two people could move it. Uh, and then a dust cover. And since it's wood, uh, annual inspection would be best. Uh, a <clears throat> motor powered uh, vehicle, but uh, not excessively uh, heavy. This this one again could be if it doesn't have to be moved too too frequently, then the axle jacks would work on that, uh, or if possible, the, the mobile mobile frame. But it. With that, it's essential to get the tires off the floor, else they will, you know, eventually permanently deform. Uh, again, the the usual, you know, empty fluids, the battery, and then if you want to go full long term, would be to get someone to disassemble the the engine and pack it uh, with, with Cosmoline and then annual inspection. Um, This one it was interesting because of the <clears throat> uh, the treads and and the runners on the front you know, modified Ford Model T turned into a snowmobile, uh, and then you could see the uh, this is a later later model got all kinds of uh, different types of components. So it's it's important. This is probably um, Full, full leather, so it's castor oil coated uh, canvas, some sort of fiber, so that, that's going to have possible inherent vice issues. And so uh, keeping the light levels controlled on this would be important with all the um, rubbers and plastics. And then the, the support uh, would be, uh, a, a bit of a challenge uh, and to, to keep it mobile as well. So what I've come up with with that would be an example of some of the things I was talking about uh, where for the, this is a view of where you're looking from the bottom of the supports up. So this would be uh, for the two runners, you would have either four wheelers or a flat, you can also use a board, uh, pa uh, padded board with caster wheels or casters um, consistent with the weight load on each corner. Uh, and then, so that's for the runners and then for the um, treads, solid, um, supports and the, this shows where the the wheels under the tread so this would completely support the treads and then at the wheels the load areas <clears throat> you um you have these cross pieces uh to support support the weight at those points with the um wheels or casters so that's that's just an example of of a very schematic design, uh, how to approach each unique vehicle. Uh, this is an extremely large uh, functional object, um, a Southern uh, uh, Railways uh, postal car that, that has gone on loan, uh, transported by rail. Uh, so it still would be technically in, in working order. Uh, you could see how heavy it is here. Um, with mainly metal or wood, but also different kinds of components on the interior. Um, obviously <laughs> it has to stay, you know, stay on rails, but uh, with this for long-term lubrication, uh, would be important and inspection for for rust and and using um, uh, moisture ex excluding lubricants uh, and 
look in the resources for uh, different uh, types of products and how to use those. But um, just a, a regular uh, spot, uh, spot maintenance and, you know, obviously cleaning so that the paint doesn't become deteriorated and also light exclusion. And if there are um, curtains or, or blinds and if, um, the light levels are fairly high, then what you can do is put um, sort of a sacrificial liner on the uh, exterior side of those to preserve the original uh, window coverings or window treatments. Um, so <clears throat> moving on, uh, these objects are um, very historically important. Uh, however, it's a little bit out, out of the scope here because most of what we've been Talking for long-term uh, storage is an interior, you know, in, in some sort of building envelope with uh, at least minimal uh, environmental controls. But due to the the size of these objects, they have they will be displayed outside uh, permanently. So that's a bit of a challenge. Um, Want to go too deep into that, but. Um, since they're, they are interesting, um, interesting challenges, I thought I'd touch on it a little bit. Um, so this gives you some information on what they are. Uh, the uh, one of them has, is fiberglass, and the other is uh, metal. The the Mystic was stabilized last year, um, and that was painted, which which is an interesting. Uh, approach, uh, and I think one that's appropriate, particularly since it's outdoors where the, the paint is, it's a more robust coating than say just annual waxing. Uh, and it serves as a, um, a sacrificial layer. So uh, since the, the original fiberglass uh, is, is really important to protect and fairly sensitive to, to light exposure. So the paint is something that's relatively easy to maintain in the long term. Uh, and you know, easy, an indicator if it's failing, you can touch it up right away. Uh, there are concerns about the internal comp uh, components and maintaining safe, safe access for assessments. Um, Again, in, in terms of uh, the animal intrusion, it would just have to seal any spots, you know, particularly from mice can get in a quarter inch. So we're using uh, appropriate materials to do that. And then possibly putting, again, monitoring and, and trapping on the inside if that becomes an issue. Uh, as far as recommendations, continue to work with um, the shipyard specialist that they, they've established a re uh, relationship with doing ongoing inspections and then um, an operations and maintenance manual have that in writing. Um, so that's an ongoing uh, thing or resources are appropriated for it. Uh, can consult the references for outdoor display. And if all possible, a, a, I would suggest a simple shelter. And here's an example of, um, this is a, a steam locomotive uh, that is in a county museum in central Minnesota. And uh, about five years ago, I uh, did the assessment, uh, conservation assessment for this. Uh, it had been restored. So what the surfaces you're seeing were 1970s and a little bit later paint scheme and restoration. Um, and then in the, I believe the 80s, the, uh, it had been displayed outdoors without any shelter and then the shelter was built 
which really improved it. The big drawback uh, to fairly recently was that there was no uh, bird exclusion means taken. So in each, particularly in the corners, um, there are extensive bird nests and bird activity. And it, you really can't see it um, from this view, but the top of the engine and the uh, coal tender were just covered <laughs> with dropping. So that those are acidic and uh, leads to corrosion. And, and then uh, from when it hadn't been, um, sheltered the uh, top of the cab, it deteriorated. It's that's wood uh, cladding in the windows here. So uh, just recently, the recommendations I wrote are, are now out for um, for a bid <clears throat> for various vendors to actually do the uh, the further stabilization and some reconstruction on it. But the the uh, shelter here has gone gone a long way and. Um, the scale is pretty similar to that of the, uh, for the submersibles. Uh, so that's, that's one way to do, uh, help with long-term preservation if it has to be outside. Uh, and then, um, this is a, um, late 19th century, uh, farm, open farm wagon, wood, wood and metal, uh, in, uh, Israel, uh, which is in a in an enclosure, but it looks not very tight. So, and there's a fair amount of light. What well, looks like it could be exposed to light here, and the front end it's cut out in a screen grab. But uh, there's the uh, pull bars are supported by a. Um, looks like saw horses, um, but the back wheels seem to be on the, uh, these stones or bricks here. Um, and if you can see it here, it's possible uh, with heavy, heavy rains that you could get some water in. Uh, so the re recommendation would with this would be to tighten up the enclosure, exclude pests, uh, if at all feasible, and uh, put in some uh, <clears throat> light control measures, at least when uh, there aren't any visitors. So some sort of curtains or uh, boards that could be put up to, to uh, eliminate light. And, and also heating, uh, the, the roof looked like a translucent fiberglass material uh, that may allow some infrared in there. So ventilation, uh, might need some ventilation, uh, you know, monitor the environment with loggers and see what that, what that is. Uh, and then improve the supports, uh, lift the wheels off the floor, uh, if there's any kind of water risk and, and then again, regular cleaning and inspections. Uh, here we have a um, traction steam engine that uh, looks similar to the uh, Mill City or a, a larger, larger version. And this one uh, has been, been restored and uh, there isn't too much uh, in the way of recommendations for this one, um, other than in, inspect and address the what looks like active corrosion and some dirt on the real rear wheels, and then and check the check the interior regularly for any kind of corrosion or possible uh, pest incursion, and then regular cleaning and maybe just change out the blocks so they're a little less in, intrusive for the chocks, I mean, for the wheels, a little less intrusive, but uh, for display. But other than that, it, it seems to be in pretty good condition. Uh, and this was one uh, case study that was submitted that's um, really out of the scope. Um, 
and into the, the realm of uh, conservation, but I just wanted to acknowledge that it was sent in. It's a unique uh, 1928 uh, auto. Uh, it does get loaned out and what, what you can see are water spotting and the, the question and concern was how to how to deal with that. Some mitigation, base level mitigation was tried, um, but it, at this point, this is really uh, needs to be looked at by a, an objects conservator. And um, if the museum contacts me uh, after the webinar, uh, I'll be happy to put you in touch with somebody in your, <clears throat> in your uh, area. That I that I've worked with that uh, would be able to help you, or at least give you, if they can't do it, um, to give you some references and, and guide you to somebody who can. But uh, what I would suggest is uh, first approach would be to do testing and research to find out what the coding is, um, and then figure out. It looks very similar to bloom on shellac, a wood shellac surface, but most likely the the coating would have been a cellulose nitrate. So, uh, <clears throat> but the first level would be uh, analysis and then some testing to figure out how to uh, how to fix that. And then. Uh, this particular piece, although <clears throat> fully functioning, go kart is actually an art object. So uh, the key thing here, you know, protecting all the the components and the aesthetics of of the piece. So as minimal an intervention as possible, and it is, as you can tell, in excellent condition. <laughs> Uh, so the fluids have been drained upon accession to the museum. Uh, it's regularly inspected. Uh, a lot of organic polymer components, as you can see. Uh, the tires do appear to be blocked off, off the surface, so that's good. Uh, and then in the long term, have a, a mechanic take a look at it and determine uh, if it needs to go the full the full route, that'd probably be the best way to go. Uh, but if it's gonna be on display, uh, something that's important is to secure the uh, smaller pieces. It's very tempting um, with something like that for visitors to get a souvenir. And with the principle of, of full access by visitors to objects, you know, and not put them behind barriers, if at all possible, uh, then it's important um, to probably use something like Loctite um, on the uh, fasteners to just, so a casual, you know, opportunistic person, you know, I'm gonna take that chrome nut off, uh, you know, try it, maybe get fingerprints on there, but they can't take it. So that's one way to do it. And that is reversible, uh, but that's something to, to consider. But my suggestion for, for long-term display or even temporary display would be, again, block it up the surface, um, secure all the components, um, and then use some, at least a half height uh, plexi barrier just, just to discourage people <clears throat> rather than just um, ropes or, or something minimal or, or even no. <clears throat> Certainly I would not, I would discourage no barrier at all. Um, so that's really uh, all the case studies and, and uh, what I had in terms of the presentation. So I'll turn it back to Robin. Hey, Paul. Hey. My camera decided to not show up. Oh, so okay. give it a second to see if I pop back on here in a second. But um, that was great. And I'm putting the link again for the resources so you guys can see that. So there I am. Great. 
So if you want to go ahead and stop sharing your screen, you're more than welcome to do that. Okay. Here we go. Great. Thank you. Um, right. We already have questions coming in, so I'm going to start looking at okay. them right now. Um, I will also add that looking at the cars, like the vehicles you were putting up, I was kept thinking mm -hmm. like that looks so much fun and also looks mildly terrifying to ride it, it on the <laughs> at the same time. Like I was like, that looks fun and terrifying. <laughs> it was like so good, good fun. Well, moving uh, the steam steam engine through the streets of Saint Paul, uh, that was truly terrifying. Yeah, I can only imagine. <laughs> well, and I'll just add real quick that my uh, my late father used to co well collected classic cars, so I was thrown in the back of random oh, okay. cars as a child in Pennsylvania without seatbelts many a time. So I know that feeling of <laughs> zooming around in a car that you're like, I hope stuff will stay on it <laughs> because we take this turn. So it's quite fun to see the pictures. Um, so one of the first questions we got is, what is the weight limit of the go jacks? There was actually a pretty big conversation about the go jacks happening in the chat for a little bit. So I thought we'd start there. Well, offhand, I don't, I don't know. I I would think it's at least three thousand pounds mm -hmm. minimum, but that's something that's fairly easy to check. Yeah. <laughs> It yeah. seems like people were saying that like those come in handy, pretty common, yes. you know what I mean, as, as something as a tool for people to use. So yes, yeah. Right. Yeah, maybe not for long term, because there's still pressure on the on the tire, you know, if we're talking rubber tires. If it's a solid, solid wheel or solid tire, then maybe but yeah, it's generally just it's good for um, moving, you know, temporary. Mm -hmm. good to have as a tool yeah and people are saying in the chat that they can go to the website they have different sizes so i would encourage you yes. to just go there if you're curious and the yeah. more specifics on yeah that. and check on the capacity exactly um someone says can you tell us more about axle jacks and how to choose appropriate ones when and where to use them so can you go into a little bit more detail just on the use of axle jacks yeah uh, i think for in my experience, uh, they work well for, you know, in terms of the older vehicles like um, Ford Model Ts and Model, Model As, and then um, Lindbergh site also has uh, what's called a Saxon 19, what was that, 1916. So it's similar to Ford, uh, and they work well for that. And the, yeah, the placement is right under, you know, near each wheel in the corner, near each wheel um, to play to place it. And then they crank, you know, crank up and down. Uh, you can get those, well, automotive suppliers, but um, really good source for materials and, and equipment for the, this kind of work is, um, you know, without being a commercial would be Gran the Granger Supply and McMaster Car. And you, they have uh, everything online uh, by category, so you, you can look there. Um, and then if needed, you could always add um, like uh, sheet ethafoam to pad so you don't get any kind of scratching or um, uh, it's that uh, it's a cross-linked um, polyethylene padding that you use actually with car dashboards it was developed on not not coroplast it's a different I, i'm blanking on the exact brand name but it's used a lot in museums for padding carts and and uh, mounts it's it's a, a fairly thin material but it, mm -hmm. it has good padding okay yeah so if anyone can think of what use. we're talking yeah. about in the chat feel free to put it there because i'm yeah. happy to see it oh someone says yes. valara Yes, thank you. Got it. There we go. Thank you, Shirley. <laughs> yes, it was right there. there and couldn't come out. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of terms out there, so don't feel bad yeah. about that <laughs> by many means. Um, someone asked for a clarification question. I think this is when we were looking at the postal vehicle with the sleds on it. They said, I'm sorry if I missed this explanation, but okay. what is meant by four wheelers? So do you have more of an explanation on that? Yes. Uh, it would. There was one in one of the photos, but it would take too much to bring that back up, so I won't do it. But there you, um, I think they're also called movers 
dollies. Okay, that's the term. Uh, so it's usually a hard, uh, like four uh, pieces of hardwood. Mm -hmm. So two, two in the front and then two on the sides and they're kind of raised up. And then they usually have carpet on there. Yeah, dollies, that, that would be the best explanation. But okay. in the MHS, we always call them four wheelers. Yeah. And then they have casters, usually solid hard rubber casters on the corners. You Again, Granger McMaster car sell every kind of caster at different capacities you can imagine. So those are all, as an aside, they're also uh, helpful suppliers uh, for object moving carts. Uh, mm -hmm. We always took the basic hard plastic rubber made carts and then would modify them for shock absorbance and change the wheels and, and get the casters from those suppliers. So you could do that with the dollies as well if you need um, a heavier capacity wheel, you could switch it out from the standard. But the movers carts, again, you could check with the supplier, but it's usually mm, at least 200 pounds, I believe. Mm -hmm. They're usually marked on there. So again, you can get them for different capacities, but those could be padded out with carpeting or whatever, or even uh, you can put um, a solid, a solid platform attach and screw that down to the basic dolly to modify it as well. So yeah, that makes sense. It's actually been kind of fascinating it. looking at the chat because some people like you're getting all these regional for what you just described. Like as soon as you started describing it, I was like, oh, furniture dolly. Like that's yeah, what I know. It. And then a lot of people say that. So I wonder if it's a regional thing because <laughs> people are yeah. like, you see everything. Someone's calling them refrigerator dollies. Yeah. Um, Someone else said they can come in different shapes. And I know exactly as soon as you said it, I was picturing it in my head. So I was like, wait, right. we use those for moving. Well, time. yeah. And, it, and that brings up, uh, I mentioned the Granger McMaster car, but there are, <clears throat> depending what area you're in, you could search for materials handling suppliers. Mm -hmm. I used to get catalogs from them. You know, they do racking and all, but also uh, equipment for moving storing and moving equipment, but uh, retrieving things. And so that that's a good, could be a good source and see what they have that could be modified and or used. Totally. Um, yeah. Question for a collection containing multiple carriages and storage. What would you say is the best material for a dust cover to balance weight for fragile canopies versus static cling for flaky paints? Hmm. Well, you could, well, polyethylene is the easiest, to, you know, to obtain and cheap, relatively cheap. Um, you could get the, you know, for, excuse me, fragile surfaces, um, the, the thinner uh, gauge, you know, the mills, you can go with two, two or four rather than six. The, mm -hmm. the examples I showed, I believe was six, you know, the heavier six mil, but those were stable surfaces. So yeah, lighter, I would say plastic rather than, because muslin could be fairly heavy and somewhat abrasive, mm -hmm. you know, that's why, you know, smoother. There's also Tyvek, which has a, fairly smooth surface, you know, that's, I would think more costly, mm -hmm. uh, but you could look at that, I think might, might be a way to go. Someone in the chat had said earlier, uh, they use parachute material for creating dust covers, which I think would be interesting. I'd be worried about this. I don't know if they're going to get static though. I'm trying to think of the material that parachutes are made out of, but I think that could be definitely an idea to experiment with in certain cases. Well, nowadays it would be rip stop, rip stop mm. nylon, which could have some static. You know, originally they were silk. So, but the nylon is kind of a silk substitute. So, okay. yeah, I think you could maybe get a sample and try and try that. But that, yeah, that would be relatively, would certainly be strong, but relatively lightweight. Mm -hmm. 
So that's one way to go. Yeah. Uh, the other question is that people were then asking where you get parachutes from. And as soon as uh, she typed it, I was thinking in my head, I was like military supply store. And that's what she said is bulk from a military supply shop. So okay. it's, it's kind of an interesting, but I like seeing those people thinking outside the box for items yeah. to kind of help out with doing it. People also talked about using um, PVC tubing to kind of help create frames for some oh. of these items, which I think is a good idea as well. When it Yeah, comes to I've, I've done that. And, you know, P PVC, of course, you know, is not in direct, con you don't want direct contact with objects, but used in that way. In fact, I, I did, something just like that with to create a micro environment for a faux leather chair that was having crystal growth issues uh mm -hmm. from high humidity and all so um yeah i used a uh, thin diameter pvc and just created a, a little canopy for it so yeah that's that's a good idea yeah for sure and like I'm saying, everyone's saying like they love these ideas in the chat, and so am I. I like seeing when people kind of out. Right, and that. and that there's a schematic uh, diagram of that in one of the CCI references. They show they show a okay. picture of that. Um, someone asks, what can you use on tires to prevent cracking? Have you had much experience with that? I don't really can't, can't think of anything, but you're the expert. you really can. That's once it's gotten to that point. Um, really for long long term storage of rubber which of course would have to come off would be uh cold cold storage but mm -hmm. yeah there were some experiments with uh, uh using things like armor all and uh various synthetics to to at least slow that down but once it once it's to that stage, you know, kind of the um, well, without getting too too deep, but with polymers, there's a sort of an inception stage, and then once it passes that, then it's really irreversible. Mm -hmm. So it would just be keep it from from any further light, you know, extremes of heat. Um, and humidity, and uh, you know, if you can exclude oxygen, but then it, you'd have to come off the vehicle. And, and even there's re recommendations in some of the literature to, particularly tires that are off a vehicle and collection, you know, as a collection item, an individual item is not even to save it, just to sample it. A section of it so you have the cross section on how it was constructed and just discard the rest of it so and and with rubberized belts that were taken off machines uh particularly it was a snowmobile i believe uh and used a anoxic enclosure for that with the ageless <clears throat> and silica gel and all that and and uh the Marvel seal, and when of course that's not exhibitable, exhibitable that's long term storage. So, but cold storage is one way to go with those. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. It seems like a lot of that rubber type stuff, there's not much you can do once it hits a certain point. No. You know what no. I mean? Like it's kind of like a point of no return. And you're just right. kind of like, I'm just trying to slow down the process, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is interesting because I think a lot of people have this experience where it says, what do you do if you have a vehicle that is considered both a piece of art, painting on exterior, and also must run as a vehicle? How often should you run it? Do you still use the Cosmoline or would you make the engine not functional? Well, if I understand the question, that would have to be a management mm -hmm decision if, if it need you know if it's something that say a car club wants to borrow uh annually for show or parade you know, or city for the parade then it sounds like it would have to be in working order so then the fluids get maintained it should be it should be jacked up when it's not being used but in uh 
if that's the decision to working order, then in between at least, so it would be total twice a year. So every six months, somebody should come in and start it up and, <clears throat> and run it for you know, 10, 15 minutes just to get everything circulating so you don't get rust and, and moisture buildup. Um, well, that, that sounds like the situation with that aerodynamic car, the 1928, where they had, it was running and they took it out and it got caught in the rain. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a tough call with that. And, and when I was at MHS, there was that situation with the Lindbergh Saxon and we had written up, there was a relationship with a local car club was really good. And we wrote up protocols where they were responsible. And, and you also have to think about insurance when the things like that are taken out. Uh, and then what needed to be done when they were finished with it, not just park it. So they're, they're cleaning and, and inspection and all that kind of stuff. So uh, <clears throat> that's, that's something to think about. And yeah. So it, it might require you know, intervention if something happens. So, um, but if, if what you're going for is preservation, then really the, the best way to ensure that is not to, <laughs> not to run it, not to take it out. So it, there's it, always compromise. It, always, it feels like in the best world, and again, this is in the best world, you would basically be able to draw that hard line, right? This is either going to be a, a vehicle that gets taken out and is kept mm -hmm. functioning, or this is going to be kept inside, <laughs> drained, <laughs> sitting there right. like as an art piece, essentially, like hanging out, not moved. But I know that in the real world, like you can't always have that nice black line. You might have something that goes into the gray. So I think that kind of what you were saying, how it's a management decision, like it's something that you have to sit there and be like, kind of go talk to your governing people and be like, all right, perfect world, we'd make a decision. This is either going to sit there or this is going to be run, you know, but right. it's hard to kind of be on both sides of that line for the preservation of these vehicles in the long yeah. run is what it feels it's, like. Right. It's a, a little easier to make the case for more of an industrial or agricultural piece, particularly on display. Car, cars, you're right, it's a little, in some cases it makes sense to run them and display them that way so the public can see it and appreciate it. But uh, like with the steam engine, and then there was also a windmill that I had worked on that's on um, display in the history center, management had wanted those to turn and run. Yeah. And it was a little easier to win the case because all I had to do was bring up OSHA uh, and that scared them off pretty much and and show them the, you know, the requirements for belt guards and, <clears throat> and that type of thing. So, and, and also the resources required to keep that going. Right. So yeah, that was something I didn't mention with the that traction engine of Mill City is the compromise was to uh, have a video of a very similar engine in the field under steam uh, next to it <clears throat> that visitors could activate, and then compressed air was hooked up to the whistle, so mm. interpreters could could sound the whistle, but we really nixed the whole thing of uh having the pulleys turn and the flywheels and all that yeah i mean i get it i i i yeah. think when you see these things like you talk about windmills and you talk about these engines you want to see them running like i think that's a natural human yeah. inclination like you want to see them going and doing their thing but i think those of us who work in the collection side of the house it's like we in our head we're thinking oh my god stuff is breaking down <laughs> thing run, yeah. you know what I mean there's more chances of stuff breaking so it's just I, I it's it's an interesting and so people are saying in the chat like yeah we've had these arguments over 35 years like that's a fundamental yeah. argument of the collection so yeah. So, yeah I find it interesting for sure well there was a, a really good article I think it's 
couple of years now in the journal of the AIC that people might want to find and look look for about that makes a good case for running functional objects just from a holistic experience approach of getting the sound and the uh, physical sensations from them running. So that's kind of the other side. So, mm -hmm. so it's worth looking at. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. um, someone has on here, our, plan our airplanes are outside and uncoverable. What could we treat the plexi canopies and windows with? Have you ever had too much experience with that? Mm. So, um, somewhat. Uh, well, would those be plexi or lexan? Because lexan really deteriorates and gets good question they said plexi in the question okay. but like if if you want to uh, correct me in the chat feel free whoever posted that the first yeah time. i'm just curious about that yeah yeah that's that's a tough one uh it, if it is the older material and it's starting to deteriorate it just it might have to be you know it depends on the individual situation might have to be replaced because if they become cracked or really deteriorated that compromise the inside so mm -hmm. uh it's maybe like a one way to do it might be a extra cover you know if it's an original and fairly good the condition you want to preserve put a like a sacrificial mm -hmm. other cover over that Mm. like a double windshield so the original is is preserved and there there are um commercial like um auto headlight compounds you can you can use for that well there's the novus product cleaners you know used for um vitrines mm -hmm. in museums that's something you can look at they have the three the three different uh grades Mm -hmm. for that if it if it actually is plexi yeah that's one okay. way to keep it maintained yeah i think it would be interesting to experiment with it a little bit and see yeah. if you get a chunk of it and just put different solvents on it and see kind of what works best you know well, you I mean? wouldn't you wouldn't want to use solvents but well, true, the, true. Cl the cleaners yeah. yeah the cleaners for sure right um someone says how often do you switch the cosmoline packing cosmoline tends to harden as it ages it can mm -hmm. become difficult to break down to clean Oh, that's, that's a good question. Uh, as far as the, the Volkswagen, that was done, well, it's about 20 years now. Um, and it's been on display. Uh, well, no, I have to, I'd have to look into that. I, I would think that would vary depending on condition. So if it's been in, fairly controlled mm -hmm. um i would think it would maintain its viscosity or, yeah uh, um sorry, that's not a great answer but uh, no no it's fine i mean i think that that's something maybe to look up you know what i mean maybe right try to find the the data sheet and see if it you know people have been doing testing on it and stuff right for sure um going back to <laughs> the fun of the furniture mover dolly mover, refrigerator mover, whatever we ended up deciding on calling those. If you put an object on a dolly four wheeler to take the weight off the object's wheels, do you then need to include a maintenance schedule of moving the dolly wheels so you don't have issues with them over time or view them as replaceable long term? Well, that would make sense uh, to do that um, if you're at, at the MNHS warehouse, I know <clears throat> that things were fairly regularly moved for um, just for access to other things. So that was never an issue. Um, so it would depend on your situation. And and there was a definitely a quarterly cleaning schedule where the um, plant management people would come in and work with the collections manager on doing that to do, just basic dusting. Uh, so in my experience, that was, 
that's not something we had to think about. It was just natural that it would get moved regularly. So, but yeah, if that's if that's not the case, then yes, I would suggest that. Yeah. Particularly if you're using the hard rubber or plastic wheels, yeah, that'd be yeah. a good idea. Yeah, I think it's a good idea to move any of that stuff every once in a while, even right. just to make sure that the wheels aren't going to all of a sudden just break. Because I know sometimes if they stay still too much and you redistribute the weight, they'll, right. you know what I mean, like yeah. bust out. So well, yeah. and it, that's why it pays to get the better, you know, the best quality wheels you can. Mm -hmm. You know, there's different grades. <clears throat> it doesn't pay to get the really cheap ones. Yeah, for sure. Well, there's still some questions left, but we're almost at time. Um, so sure. what I would like to do is if you're comfortable, um, if we can share your contact information um, within the mm -hmm. chat, I can do it or I can follow up later to send people. Which email address would you like to share with folks um, in case they have any follow-up questions? It's a, it's I'm sorry, the Google one would be best. Okay, so email. yeah, I will look that up real quick so we can share that in the chat. Um, I wanna give a huge thank you to everyone who submitted um, case studies because they were like super interesting to look at for sure. And I really enjoyed, you know, reading about them and kind of seeing um, what people were, were talking about and just the varied things that we saw within the collection itself. Um, I'm not finding your Google email address very quickly. I see your other one. So could you say it out to us real quick? And I'm happy to type it out into the chat. Yes, P, initial P, and then Seth Storch. So P S E T H S T O R C H at gmail.com. Okay. So I have P S E T H, and then your last name, S T O R C H at right. gmail.com. Okay. Right. There it is. Um, so we have that on there. I'm putting a couple links in the chat as well, including our resource page, the survey, and then also the link to that Save America's Treasures grant that I talked about at the beginning of the chat in case anyone's interested in that. Um, I want to say a huge thank you, Paul, for all the hard work for this presentation, because this was a lot of information, but it was really interesting. So okay, thank you great. for doing that for sure. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, thank you to IMLS. Thank you to Learning Times to act as our producer. Um, we will get this recording up probably within a couple days, and I encourage you again to go to our website. And I would say just meet up, up for December. We have a December webinar and a January one. So if you're interested in registering for those, go to connectingtocollections.org. So thanks again, Paul. Thank you, Mike. And all we right. will see you all next month. So thanks. And all bye. Right. Bye.